How do I even begin to climb this mountain of turd? Hello everybody, I'm back to commemorate nearly 10 years of covering Doctor Who on this channel. This season kicked off rather awkwardly at Christmas and this trend has continued with the first two episodes that have been released for this eight episode season one, AKA series 14. It's a shame because I was actually quite hyped for the content that wasn't dependent on dragging old characters out of the closet, but I wasn't expecting sci-fi involving babies in an episode that is also aimed at babies. I get this is a family friendly show, but who exactly does this episode appeal to? Like I can defend episodes with farting aliens, but trying to defend base babies is something I simply cannot do. Before we get started, I want to give a big shout out to my patrons because you guys have been keeping the dream real for years now. Like with the 60th anniversary specials, I will be hosting a Patreon exclusive discussion of each new Doctor Who episode that is coming out over the next few weeks. We had a great discussion last Sunday and I hope to see you on the next one. It will be on Sunday at 11 a.m. BST. Check out the server and my Patreon page for more details. Now, <sighs> Without further ado, let's get on with the review. Yeah, something about this title sequence still feels off. The episode itself starts at the very end of Church of Ruby Road. Ruby is curious about the Doctor's actual name, which he naturally shrugs off in his familiar way. They use titles like the Doctor or the Bishop, the Rani, or the Conquistador. I wasn't quite expecting his pronunciation of Conquistador to be so off either. Conquistador. We get a recap of where the Doctor's from and that he's the last one left, blah blah blah. And they set off before Ruby can get a chance to react to anything he's said. Gallifrey! And where's that? Gone! They died. It was a genocide and they died. Even her reaction to the mention of genocide made a plank of wood look exciting. Anyway, the pair set off and step out to see dinosaurs. Hey, didn't I make a reaction video to this clip last week? As predicted, the scene's dilemma of stepping on a butterfly gets undone faster than you can say Quidditch. The Doctor can not only revive dead insects with his minty Time Lord breath, but also thanks to a switch in the TARDIS he forgot to flick on, one that can apparently prevent the pair from being chained when traveling into the past. This is quite a neat way of explaining how Ruby didn't get zapped out of existence thanks to the actions of Maestro in the following episode, as well as why the Doctor and Donna were able to change gravity to Mavity in their little escapade last year. With Ruby transformed back to her regular old self, she is persuaded to return to the TARDIS without questioning why the Doctor is treating such a beautiful place like a pit stop. She doesn't seem to remember being turned into Rubathon Blue, so why she would be so happy to leave so quickly baffled me somewhat. Perhaps like the killing of the Goblin King in the previous episode, the Doctor is treating Ruby with this what she doesn't know can't hurt her mentality, which will hopefully have lasting consequences for the pair as the series goes on. With the pacing of the episode set to light speed setting, the pair then decide to see what humanity is up to in the year 21506. The first thing they find is a monster in a corridor that generates fear in the characters, but struggles to have the same effect on me. For one thing, the characters and the monster barely share a shot together and the chase is cut up worse than paper going through a shredder. The way these sequences with the monsters are edited and shot, it's so hard to tell how far away the monster is from the characters at any given point. None of it really gets to showcase the amount of time and effort that went into creating the monster. It looks really good when you see it in Unleashed, but the editors simply don't let the camera linger on it for very long, except when it's being ejected out of the airlock for some reason. There are times where the episode just cuts to the monster for the sake of a jump scare without any form of suspense built up to it prior. It was like the producers thought, right, there's your monster. Now let's move on to the next set piece. There is an in-story reason for why the characters are scared in that the monster generates an infrasound noise that instinctively makes people fearful. I'm not sure what kind of audio setup viewers would require for such frequencies to be felt, but none of the monster's sound design made me feel fearful at all. On the surface, this whole babies in vats thing is kind of messed up, but humorously, the doctor lists some possible reasons for why intergalactic humanity might want to generate offspring 
spring on board their spaceship instead of doing it the old fashioned way. Before we get bogged down in the details, the producers insist they need to show off another spectacular view for Ruby to wow at. Push the button. Just 10 minutes ago, you said genocide. Look at his goofy smile. What the hell is this? It's just genocide, babes. Don't worry about it. The tonal shifts that happen in the first 10 minutes of this episode are absolutely baffling. The Doctor then goes on to gloat about how great his life is to a girl whose family is actually tied to the constraints of rent, bills, and... Uh, survival. I don't have a job either. I don't have a boss or taxes or rent or bills to pay, but I have freedom. It could be a really enticing thing for somebody to escape from, but the delivery from Gatwa just doesn't come off that way at all. All the while, Ruby is just smiling, all shiny-eyed about it, willing to accept this man's embrace, which still feels awkward as heck. The pair's chemistry is still lost on me, and it feels like the show is forcing us to like the pair instead of earning it. Another new magic trick up the Doctor's sleeve is that he can disable the TARDIS's translation circuits with a slice of his arm. I'm not sure why they couldn't have just left this writing to the imagination, but before we can even think about that, we're treading more familiar footsteps with the Doctor giving Ruby the ability to call her mum 19,482 years in the past. This was the point where I felt the refamiliarization truly outstayed its welcome. This minute-long clip not only recycles a well-earned, character-driven moment from an episode 19 years prior, but turns the quality dial down to painful mediocrity, as though what we really needed was more gadget gear nostalgia bait. So that was my mum on Christmas Eve on my birthday 10 minutes ago. That's the best signal ever. How much that cost? I think that's amazing. You want to see the bill? This is pure laziness. To make matters worse, Ruby's amazement is completely shelved in favour of the Doctor pushing the plot along. He was so insistent on Ruby doing it, almost as though it would keep her occupied for a little bit while he investigated the ship. Play with your phone for a bit. I need to focus on things. Rewatching the phone scene in the end of the world, it's almost unsurprising how much better it is. And not only do the characters actually debate and disagree with each other, but the one thing that really stood out to me was the score. Both that series and this one are scored by Murray Gold, but it's so much more prominent and complimentary in the former compared with whatever is heard playing beneath the latter that is completely lost in the mix. Then a talking baby wheels itself into the room and the first plunging quality occurs. But, gee, why? We've been waiting for an awfully long time. I was willing to accept the presence of babies, but to generate artificial mouth movement just so they can talk? Why? Just why? Were? They could have just had speakers attached to them, like the lawnmower dog from Rick and Morty or something. Credit where it's due, the visual effects department did create whole new CGI masks for the babies instead of just superimposing these child actors' mouths onto them. But that still doesn't stop them looking uncanny as hell. We need oxygen to breathe. And I pulled this string and that string. Child labour laws preventing babies from being on set for more than two hours a day meant that the producers had to create these horrifying fake babies which had their CGI faces superimposed over the top. So those without teeth look the worst, but even those that do can't stop those lips looking fake as f But mommy and daddy left us. <sighs> Not to mention when two of them start crying as silent as the night with a pipette teardrop on their cheeks with eyes as white as the moon. This was all so dumb. And it only got worse from there. Nappies are changed at 1800 hours. Oh, can't wait to see that. I'll get the baby wipes. Space babies. So this is the setup. A group of babies are living on this ship with the voice of Nanny looking after them all. For some reason, the babies are super smart and can talk and have their noses wiped periodically. Their snot is used to create a monster in the corridors below because apparently children need bogeymen. To make things more confusing, there's not only a computer that educated them all, and the voice of Nanny turns out to be a human overseeing their care, a human who did accounting? The Doctor and Ruby start doing daycare duty where the Doctor flips between being this lovely, nurturing, empathetic character to being filled with glee at the prospect of scaring babies. So scary. <laughs> Nanny, you tell them there's no such thing as 
I kind of prefer this side of the Doctor, probably because I didn't personally find the monster to be scary. I first read the script and I was like, the bogeyman. Cool. Lol. <laughs> Shame we didn't get to see more of it, honestly. He then puts a headset on to speak to Nanny, despite being able to speak to her without it. And it was around this point in the episode where I started to feel like the actors had struggled to learn their lines. Nanny, these babies are trying their best space babies, but this station is in trouble. You have got a buildup of pressure on Hull 3B, and something is ramping up down with the boogeyman list. And if that continues, baby boom. There is no such thing as the boogeyman. That thing was more sort of like a, uh... Why are all these cuts necessary? The pair head to where Nanny is camped out, but are interrupted by a flashback to the abandonment scene from Ruby Road. Memories being altered in that whoever abandoned Ruby turns around and points at the Doctor, and it gets all snowy in the corridor for some reason. I have been to the ends of time and back, and I have never seen anything like this before. Oh yeah, the end of time. Back. <laughs> That's nothing compared to uh, indoor snowing and flashbacks. Okay. The third adult character in the story is established as being somebody that has had to whack a leaking pipe for six years. The previous captains of these baby farm spaceships are all seen condemning the company they work for. Nanny claims it is because of a recession that led to the governmental abandonment of the baby stations, despite this vague intergalactic government apparently being the ones who made it illegal to close the stations in the first place. It is an unholy mess of a plot that seems to solely be in service of propping up this very weak theme of adoption that both the Doctor and Ruby seem to share. Don't get me wrong, I like the idea that humans have become apathetic towards their offspring when grown in space. If the growing of babies makes them so easily abandoned, what has happened to human relationships to make this a necessity? The details are sketchy, which could either be intentional or displays a lack of imagination towards this episode's world building. Presumably the automated system prevented the need for teachers or childminders, and it was this very automation that brought about their abandonment. Nanny is very hesitant to disclose the details of how bad the situation really is. She claims that she's been looking after the children for six years. This is a closed station. There's only so much air, there's only so much food. And I would have thought an accountant of all people with all that time would be concerned about counting up every last drop of oxygen, food and water. Yet she gives this vague, it's only a matter of time statement of concern before their attention is diverted to finding a planet that will take in all these babies. Sadly, the allure of the story gets dashed when one of the babies decides to take on the bogeyman with a little toy sword. The shot of the sword falling to the floor had me thinking that this was the end for this baby called Eric, but instead they cut to him claiming he's scared. I can totally see why people thought this moment felt off. We're so used to shots like this being indicative of an off-screen death without the character changing its tune about bravery seemingly for no reason. Ruby and the Doctor then rush down to the lower levels to save him, making me wonder how on earth one of their strollers could possibly fit inside the elevator that can barely squeeze two people in. Eric is seen missing from the chair, causing Ruby to go into full bludgeoning angry mother mode. The pair find the baby, thanks to it pooping its pants and filling the corridors with its stench. Yep. This is Doctor Who in 2024, folks. Something obviously turned the stroller over, but did that happen after the baby somehow got out and crawled all the way down these corridors into a hidey bunker that exists for some reason? The duo then take Eric and find themselves in a dead end, which is when four other babies show up with a makeshift flamethrower. Babies to the rescue! Good God, this episode. How the hell did they manage to rig this thing up? The Doctor then manages to summon the broken stroller by whistling, no less, and sends the babies back to the upper decks. Instead of calling it a day and sending the babies and Nanny to relative safety in the TARDIS, the Doctor insists on finding out what the monster on the lower decks is. Even Nanny isn't too fussed about her saviors lingering around downstairs for a bit longer despite being trapped on the ship. 
for six bloody years. It's here we get the twist that the monster is, as previously mentioned, made of ba <laughs> baby pokies. I couldn't even say it with a straight face. I was honestly half expecting it to be made of babies and feces, but bogies are better if only marginally. It's not the worst twist ever, and I did find the Doctor and Ruby's explosive reactions to this revelation to be very entertaining. The knowledge of this monster's body composition suddenly changes the perspective of all the characters that it's not worth killing, with the exception of Nanny. The perspective might have been a little different if the bogeyman had actually been a threat, but because one baby miraculously escaped its clutches, there isn't really much justification for killing it. It was quite funny to think that 10 minutes minutes earlier, the Doctor was praising the babies for nearly burning the monster to a crisp. Hilariously as well, this sudden change in attitude starkly contrasts with the Doctor killing the Goblin King for threatening to eat babies one episode earlier. <laughs> Nanny, Why the babies are suddenly so concerned about the bogeyman's well-being as well, I have no idea. Your favourite monster is fine. Wait, you left it in the airlock? Why is it howling like a wolf now? What the f- what is this episode? Despite me saying that bogeys were a good substitute for human waste- I am gonna let it rip! <laughs> My god, let that sink in. It was six years of babies' nappies that stopped the ship from being able to fly. Diapers will fly! What about all the other ships that have baby farms still running? No concern for potential bogeymen on them either? The once rite of passage gifting a TARDIS key is given to Ruby Sunday after one adventure. The Doctor really must be desperate for some companionship if he's giving them away this quickly. Ruby at this point is such a non-character, rushed in to fill the supposedly mandatory position of a companion. Do people actually find her to be relatable or likeable? Her name sounds like a bougie ice cream. I realise I've probably changed my tune somewhat since Christmas, but she didn't exactly show off much of who she is or what she's like in this episode. Oh, we did find out one thing. Thing. She doesn't like bogeys. <laughs> Great. The only condition the Doctor has for Ruby being his companion is that they don't go back in time to find her parents. He goes on this big speech about how meeting her birth mother would be so damaging to their relationship and the universe at large, but simultaneously he proved that all it takes is a flick of a switch on the TARDIS console to prevent such meddlings from having dire consequences. If this wasn't what the opening of the episode set out to do, what was the point in its inclusion? I am turned into a lizard and I remember Russell calling it most expensive top two joke in history. Wait, there was a joke in that scene? So, did it suck? This was not a great start to the series, folks. I'm sorry, but saying the episode's title 11 times... Space babies! Space babies. 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 doesn't make it any less cringy. This episode might hold the speedrun world record for checking off all the need-to-know Doctor Who lore points. There's some entertaining moments, but the plot is fumbled, the pacing is all over the place, and lacks any form of substance. They could have made an interesting episode about growing humans in space, but they turned it into something so immature and tone-deaf, lacking the world-building to create any form of ethical dilemma for us to chew on. God forbid I have the misfortune of ever watching this episode again. I give Space Babies a 2 out of 10. It's terrible, isn't it? It's terrible. I get paid to do this. <laughs>